All right, let's get going. Uh, thanks everyone for coming um, to my presentation on real-time tuning. Um, I'm Grazian Krishan, um, and to give you a bit of context about me, uh, I work for NI here in Austin, um, and I uh, makes uh, hardware and software for test and measurement systems. Um, I'm part of the real-time OS group um, where uh, we use preempt RT-based kernels um, and we build our distro based uh, on open embedded and Yocto. We mainly work with 32-bit ARM systems and uh, Intel systems, uh, mostly Atom class, uh, some Xeons up to 20 cores max, so pretty small systems. Um, I also happen to be the maintainer for the Linux kernel shipping on RT hardware um, at NI. Um, so in this presentation, I'm gonna try to cover really quickly just a slide or two on what real-time is, uh, mention the tools you can use to work with real-time systems, and hopefully spend most of my time uh, talking about some of the tuning knobs you can use to get better RT performance out of your system, some of the safety nets you might need to remove for the same reasons, and uh, some of the gotchas we encountered along the way and uh, things to avoid. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to go into any implementation details about preempt RT or anything like that or do an in-depth review of tools. Um, there's a lot of good presentations out there um, on the tools to work with RT. Uh, so at a very high level, real time is really all, of, all it is about is having a deterministic response to a stimulus. If an event happens, we want the system as a whole to uh, act in a, a bounded and predictable amount of time. We call that latency. Events can be asynchronous, a sensor exceeding a threshold, threshold uh, something happening in the real world, or it can be synchronous clock-driven uh, events. Uh, periodic tasks that happen. But the, the main thing about it is this uh, concept of latency and uh, responding in a bounded and, and uh, predictable amount of time uh, having uh, max latency. Uh, Real-time systems today can get really complex. Um, that's actually one of the reasons preempt RT is good at it because you can use the full Linux ecosystem to do really complex sensors uh, like cameras and, and ML in your control loop and stuff like that. Um, but the, the same idea of uh, having a bounded latency and um, a response to something happening holds. Um, it, it can be catastrophic in some cases to miss your latency deadline. Uh, you might run over somebody. Um, so if it's all about measuring latency, what kind of tools do you use for that? Uh, like I mentioned before, you can have, uh, th these systems can get really complex. You can have cameras and complex actuators, a bunch of I.O., a bunch of CPUs. Where do you start? Um, so my, my recommendation is to actually take a layer approach. And the first thing we do, and we do this on every kernel upgrade, we, we run cyclic tests. Um, at its core, it's, uh, it's a pretty simple test. It basically uh, spawns a bu bunch of threads, and then uh, you do this measurement loop where you take a timestamp, time you sleep for a period of time, take another timestamp, and from that you can compute the latency, the wake-up latency of that thread. And, and you can do more uh, interesting statistics like histograms and stuff like that. Um, it's also important to simulate the load you expect, or actually uh, maybe even stress it beyond the load you expect on the system. And you can use tools like iPerf to saturate your network link or like FIO to do uh, disk IO. Uh, Hackbench is a good tool to just stress the scheduler with background tasks. Um, there's a, a lot more um, things like this. Um, I also like to plot the histogram that cyclic test produces a text histogram. I like to plot it. Uh, after a while, you start to see patterns. If you plot the histogram you get from cyclic test, it's a useful thing to plot. It's just a simple Python script. Um, one thing that cyclic test doesn't measure, cyclic test measures a lot of things. Uh, it, it can measure uh, preemption being disabled, interrupts being disabled, and so on. But it's usually driven by a local CPU timer. So it's not going to include your I.O. latency. So it's a good idea to write a set of tests that um, include your I.O. latency in this measurement loop, and, and you can loop back your I.O., your analog out, your analog in, and, and do kind of the same measurement loop where you read the inputs, do some processing, update the output, and see how long that takes, or measure how many of these loops you can do per second. 
Um, we have a set of tests like this. Um, I'll come back to this graph. They're really useful to find regressions when we do kernel upgrades and, uh, and check our drivers that they still work and have good RT performance. I'll come back to this graph in the gotcha section. Um, but ultimately, you have to test the whole system latency, and you have to do it for multiple days, weeks, months, and, and uh, stress the system beyond its expected operating point to, be, to have any kind of certainty that in a complex system like this, it's going to behave correctly in all situations. Uh, there's a bunch of other tools. Uh, cyclic test and Hackbench are part of RT test. There's a lot more in there. RT eval is another uh, combination of cyclic test uh, in a load and some scripting. Um, the Linux test project has a section for real time. Um, RTLA, uh, I'm going to plug Daniel's uh, talk on Thursday. Um, it's taking a white box approach to uh, detecting where your latencies are coming from using tracing for that. It's really interesting. I encourage you to see that. Um, so then, once you know you have some latencies in your system, how do you go about debugging it? I'm just going to mention the tools here. The top three are my favorite tools. Uh, I use F-Trace, Trace Command, and Kernel Shark all the time. Um, it's it's uh, really convenient uh, uh, to interact with the trace file system directly, for example. for You can just start the trace from your application. It's, you, by writing to files. I use trace command uh, to extract the trace and, and do post uh, filtering uh, and kernel shard just to see what's going on. And it's, um, it's my bread and butter tool. Um, there's other tools that are useful. I mentioned LTTNG there. There's a bunch of other tracing frameworks um, that I have no personal experience with, but uh, you can find talks on them. Um, Perf is really useful for uh, debugging the hot paths in your application and kind of figure out where, where the CPU is spending the time. Uh, it also has a really useful mode where you can diff uh, uh, results from previous versions so you can figure out where your regressions are coming from. Uh, there's new tools now based on BPF, B, like BPF Trace and the, B, uh, the BPF Compiler Collection. There's, uh, they're really useful if you want to do custom instrumentation, custom tracing. Uh, and don't discard if you are close to your hardware team and have access to a scope and like some digital lines. Sometimes it can be very useful to have an external reference you can check uh, against and, and figure out how long something took. Um, like I said, uh, Steven, among other people, pr did a bunch of presentation on these tools. You can find uh, the recordings from previous DLCs. Um, so now, how do you go about tuning with a system to get the best performance out of it? Um, the first step is, of course, getting, uh, since I'm talking about preempt RT, is getting a, a preempt RT kernel uh, installed. Most of the distros these days provide one. Uh, if you want to build one from source, uh, you can uh, use the stable RT or the devel RT branches. Um, for now, I, I, I put it for now in, in brackets there because the preempt RT patch is it's on its way upstream and maybe by the end of the year you won't uh, need to uh, use a separate branch. Um, there's also birds of a feather I want to plug that Steven is going to do on Friday uh, and I think there's going to be a lot more details on, on the status of the preempt RT patch and where things stand uh, as of now. Um, one thing I wanted to mention on this slide is if this is all you do, if you just install a, a preempt RT kernel and expect better performance, you're going to be really disappointed. Um, if you don't do any of the tuning, uh, it's actually probably going to behave worse. Um, uh, Real-time systems have to be designed from the ground up to have real-time performance. Uh, so basically what you need to do is identify your RT workloads in, in your application, in your system, and then uh, uh, decide on a scheduling policy and priorities, or, or if you're using schedule deadline, uh, things like runtime, deadline, and period. And on the right-hand side of that uh, slide, I kind of uh, listed the various scheduling policies that are available and kind of what preempts what, uh, like schedule deadline will preempt schedule 5 and so on. Um, so my recommendation is to use schedule 5 or schedule deadline if you have uh, for your critical loads. Um, and for SCAD FIFO, you need to pick a priority in the one to, well, it goes from one to 99. Don't use 99. It's used by the kernel migration threads and can get you in trouble if you use it. I will pick something from one to 98. Or if you're using a SCAD deadline, yeah, you need to provide those parameters for each of your threads. Um, don't forget to adjust the priorities of your interrupts. 
the ones that are part of the ORRT loop, uh, you're probably going to want them higher priority, and the rest, uh, you're going to want to have lower priority for them. Uh, same goes for uh, uh, kernel threads and so on. Um, and use everything that runs, uh, for everything that runs in the background, use scatter um, or lower priority. Um, so it won't interfere with uh, your RT loads. Um, the other way you can isolate your RT workloads from, um, from everything else that's happening on the system is by partitioning your CPUs. Uh, it's, it is a good idea to designate some CPUs as housekeeping CPUs, and, and that's where you're going to want to move uh, all your background uh, like workloads or like uh, things like the kernel work queue threads. Um, and uh, same goes for uh, interrupts. Uh, most of them you can uh, affinitize to a certain core, and it's a good idea to do that, uh, depending on if they're part of your real-time loop or not. Um, and for, for re really sensitive workloads, uh, you might want to actually isolate the CPU, um, even from the scheduler take. And for that, you can enable full dynamic takes if you, if you set the config no hertz full uh, option in your kernel. And then by setting uh, the isol CPU and no hertz full uh, kernel uh, parameters at boot, uh, you can isolate that uh, CPU uh, from, from the kernel scheduler. And then you can uh, explicitly assign uh, a, a thread to it. And that allows you to run a real-time thread uh, basically at 100% of C, uh, CPU utilization without interference from anything else. And you can get some really good latency numbers uh, by doing that. Um, I forgot to mention on a previous slide, but uh, you can set uh, the scheduling priority uh, and, and scheduling policy using tools like CHRT or the sketch syscalls. Uh, for partitioning CPUs, uh, CPU sets is a, it's a good tool. Um, the C group version one actually works better for RT because you have thread level granularity compared to C, uh, C group version two. Yes, Stephen. Yes, that's the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect segue. Uh, <laughs> yes, so the other thing you need to do is uh, delegate your RCU callbacks uh, to threads. Then, then you can move uh, to your housekeeping CPUs uh, by specifying that RCU node CB CPU list at boot. Um, and that's how you do it. Um, uh, other things you need to worry about, don't do memory allocations from your real-time context. Do, you, do all your allocations up front, if possible. Uh, allocations can cause page faults, and obviously that's a bad thing for, your, for latency. Uh, also consider resolving uh, symbols as startup, like if you have shared libraries, you want to resolve all the symbols as startup so you don't, don't uh, get uh, dynamic like behavior later that, that it hits your latency. And, um, after you do all that, it's a good idea to lock all your pages for your real-time processing memory uh, using mlock all. Uh, you can specify current and future flags that will, that will basically keep uh, your code and data pages from being uh, paged out and, and introduce big latencies. Uh, the delay VM instead timer, uh, it's a good idea if you're using the CPU isolation feature uh, and you want to eliminate all, all latency sources. Um, the other thing you need to check uh, is your clock sources. And you can check that uh, under that SysFS path. Uh, for Intel-based CPUs, you really want to use TSC. All the other timing sources have big latencies by comparison. Um, and it's also a good idea if you're doing tracing to check what trace clock is used, um, just to make sure your data makes sense. Um, the other big knob that it's a good idea to turn off uh, to, to improve your, your RT performance is power management. Um, going into uh, uh, sleep states or power states uh, can, can introduce large latencies, and um, so it's a good idea to disable CPU frequency scaling and the CPU freak driver. Um, disable power management. You can do that at boot for P states and C states. You can do uh, things at runtime for C states. Um, by the way, uh, all uh, the slides are already uploaded, so uh, you can you can read this at leisure later. Um, 
And uh, when it comes to firmware bias um, on Intel, uh, same idea, disable P states, C states. Um, Hyper-threading, uh, up until relatively recently, um, it was, the recommendation was to disable it uh, because you can get interference from the sibling core. Uh, with core scheduling, I believe it's possible now to leave it uh, enabled, and, and with careful design, you can, you can make use of SMT and not uh, pay the penalty. Um, Turbo Boost can introduce variations in latency. Uh, it's debatable if you can leave it on or not. Um, Memory corrections, there's, there's some like uh, deep levels of memory correction that can add a bunch of, uh, of latency. Um, it's a good idea to set it at the lowest functional level possible. It's also a good idea to disable peripherals that you're not using because they're just gonna generate interrupts and stuff uh, and, and increase your latency. Um, legacy hardware sometimes can be actually implemented in, in, in BIOS uh, via like SMI interrupts, and I'll get back to those system management interrupts. I'll get back to that in the gotcha section. And there might be other options in your BIOS that you need to tweak and test and see if they, what kind of impact they have, uh, depending on who your BIOS, uh, BIOS vendor is. Um, so let's talk a bit about safety nets. Uh, probably the biggest one is RT throttling. Um, that is a feature that reserves a certain percent, configurable percentage of CPU uh, for non-real-time tests. So if your, if your real-time thread goes above a certain percentage, it will get throttled. Obviously, that has a huge impact on latency. We actually disable that on our systems by default, and we're telling people to rely on just a, a hardware watchdog to, to catch runaway RT tests that, that might consume all your CPUs. Or, um, or yeah, and, and educate, we try to educate our users uh, from the get-go to design their applications where they allow a, a, a headroom for other background tests to run uh, on a CPU. Um, if you're on Intel and you've proven that your TSC clock is stable and you can use it, it's a good idea to disable the watchdog um, because it can, again, it can interfere with things. Same thing goes for like soft and hard lockups. After you validate your system is stable and runs uh, good, um, you can disable those. And um, again, for for machine machine check errors, uh, you basically you can ignore the corrected errors because uh, there's another kernel thread that runs in the background and it adds noise. And especially if you're trying to do full dynamic takes and CPU isolation, it's gonna prevent the system from, from being able to uh, disable the scheduler tick. Um, some safety nets for memory. Um, you might consider disabling memory over commit. Um, that, that will make it where like allocations will basically fail with, uh, with like malloc will fail of returning null. And if your application is written correctly, then it can handle that as opposed to allocating as much memory as you want and then finding out later that you exceeded the physical space available and uh, um killer getting involved. And speaking of the um killer, it's also a good idea to prioritize processes you want to kill and processes you don't want killed. Uh, like for example, uh, if you echo minus 17 for whatever is your RT process, uh, that, that will make it unkillable and it's a good idea, right? Um, you also should be deciding what to do on uh, out of memory situation and the recommendation is to actually make the system reboot rather than rely on the um killer to kill a random process and then your your the system will continue running but you don't know if, in what degraded state it is um, so that can create problems it's it's often better to reboot and get back to a good state um, this I hesitate to put up, but if your system is completely disconnected from network and you put epoxy in your USB slots, um, you can consider disabling the mitigations. They do have a pretty big performance impact in cert on certain workloads, and there's a handy kernel parameter that you can just set mitigations off um, and gain back that performance. But like I said, be really careful with this. Um, so now uh, for some gotchas, um, things to avoid. Uh, I already mentioned system management interrupts. These are uh, basically hardware, uh, firmware, uh, hardware interrupts that are handling firmware in BIOS or UFI on Intel. And they're high priority, they're unmaskable. Um, they're used for things like temperature uh, management, uh, legacy hardware emulation, uh, patching hardware bugs in some cases. 
the trouble with them is the transitions to the system management mode uh, via these system management interrupts is completely uh, like Linux doesn't even know about it. It's, it's, uh, the OS is unaware. Um, so you're just gonna see this like big latency spike and even if you look at the trace, you're just gonna see like basically the, the time ju uh, stamp jumped um, and you don't know what happened, but uh, your system is gonna see large latency. Um, SMIS and SMM are x86 specific, but uh, there are uh, similar uh, similar privilege modes on, on uh, other architectures, like the secure monitor mode on ARM. Um, there's a good wiki page by the uh, Real-Time Collaborative Project uh, that talks about this and, and shows you what tools you should be using uh, to try to detect uh, this SMIS happening. And, there's not much you can do. I mean, you can, if you can figure out what the uh, situation was that triggered the SMI, you might be able to avoid it. Um, worst case scenario, you might need to select a different piece of hardware um, that doesn't suffer from, from a lot of this. Um, speaking of interrupts, this, are, this is on the kernel side, and this is the graph I showed at the beginning that was showing the degradation when I was doing that a, uh, analog in test, analog out loop test. Um, so when we upgraded to from 414RT to 510RT, we discovered this drop in performance you see there. Um, and we couldn't figure out at first what, what happened, but basically when the preempt RT patch was rewritten for upstream, I believe if, if I'm explaining this correctly, uh, you can only have now a single soft IRQ per core and uh, there is uh, the bottom uh, half lock. Uh, it's getting uh, basically um, both soft IRQs and, and forced thread interrupts use the uh, bottom half lock. And this will cause basically latencies in your forced thread interrupts. If you don't request interrupts specifically, you would request threaded interrupts, which doesn't take that bottom half lock. lock. So after we switch to our driver to request threaded IRQ directly, as opposed to just relying on preempt RT for threading your interrupt handler, um, we gain back the performance. In fact, 510 is much better than 414. If you look at that graph, it's the latency spread is, the jitter in the latency is much smaller and performance, it's basically, the max performance is about the same. Um, another interesting one is MMIO CPU stalls. Uh, so this is a, a cyclic test histogram that I took and a couple of years, it's a couple of years old now. Um, and in, in the background, I was just accessing a TPM chip. And I was seeing this huge 400 microsecond added latency tail on the histogram. And, and um, the reason for that is if you look at, uh, this happened to be an Apollo Lake system. If you look at the uh, CPU diagram or the system diagram for that, um, you can see the core where your code is executing up there on the left and the TPM chip is all the way on the right, and there's this long path that goes through all the IO, this IO fabric blocks that are all uh, different bus widths and different frequencies, uh, which means there's a bunch of buffering happening in the way to transition from all these IO fabrics. And at the end, you go through a fast SPI a bus uh, to access that TPM chip. And what happens is there's this common pattern where um, there's a bunch of register writes happening in a row to, to this TPM chip to configure it. And then there's a, a status register read. And if the read is right after all those writes that happen in a row, what happens is the writes will get buffered along the way in the fabric, but the read, because of the architecture ordering guarantees, has to wait for all those writes to actually propagate all the way to the hardware, the writes to take effect, and then you get your status register back. But then the net result is your CPU will stall waiting for all those writes to go through all those buses and um, to all the way to your TPM chip. Um, and this can happen with a lot of peripherals. We've, we've also seen it with uh, an Ethernet PHY. Uh, and we discovered that by accident by bumping an Ethernet cable while we were running cyclic test and we saw the latency spike. And it was, it's kind of the same pattern. Basically the PHY chip is trying to do the link negotiation for Ethernet. So there's a bunch of writes to that chip and then a read that will stall everything. And obviously this is bad because you don't want your RT application to fail just because you bumped into an ethernet cable that's not even part of your RT. Like you might not even use network communication in your RT application, but it's just background load. Um, 
I don't have a good solution for this other than test for it and try to avoid it. And we have a couple of ugly uh, patches that are really not upstreamable where it, uh, in, in a couple of drivers where we saw a bunch of these writes and a read happening, we basically added a delay uh, to let the, to give time to the, for those writes to propagate to the device and now stall the CPU. Um, another big one, after you solve all the, the tuning knobs and all that, probably the most common one I see when I debug RT applications is priority inversions. So uh, just to explain this, um, if, if you have three threads there, like a high priority thread, age, medium priority thread, low priority thread, and let's say the low priority thread starts running first and it acquires a, a lock or some other mutual exclusive resource. And uh, it's doing its thing and then the high priority thread comes along and preempts the low priority thread. And that's all fine, that's what we expect uh, if you're using the FIFO scheduler. Uh, but at, at some point, H wants the same mutual exclusive resource or lock, so it blocks uh, because L is holding that lock. Um, the problem is that in the meantime, you can have this medium priority thread that's completely unrelated to anything that, that becomes runnable, and because it, uh, it, it is the highest priority, after the, our H thread blocks, it is the highest priority thread on the system, so it will get scheduled in, and it can run as long as it wants, and it creates this unbounded latency in your high priority thread, who cannot grab the log because L is holding it, but L cannot run because the M thread is preempting it. Uh, so this is really bad and it can lead to high uh, latencies. This is kind of how it looks in, uh, in kernel shark, especially if you write the test to specifically reproduce this. Um, but you can see uh, the, low uh, the order is, is inverted by the low priority thread on top there, medium, high, and you can see how the high thread gets blocked and then your medium thread can run forever. And only at the end of that, the, lock, uh, the low priority thread can get scheduled in and release the lock. And, um, the high priority thread gets to run. Uh, the, the solution implemented in preempt RT for this is called priority inheritance. And the gist of it is basically at the point where H blocks on the lock, in order to prevent this priority inversion, the, pri the priority of the L thread, the low priority thread, gets boosted to the priority of the high thread. Um, and that makes it where then uh, this uh, interfering me uh, medium priority thread cannot come in and, and screw up your day. Uh, so uh, the low priority thread gets to run a high priority for just the right amount of time to release that log, and then the high priority thread can continue. And this is how it looks in kernel shark. Um, you see there like the high priority thread running, blocks on the log, the low priority thread gets boosted, runs for a bit, releases the log, and, um, and so on. And you can see it in the trace events too if you can't read it. Um, so it is a common problem and it's, uh, the, it's unfortunately it's common because there's, there's a lack of priority inheritance support for locking primitives. Uh, with the libp thread, uh, glibc library, uh, the only uh, primitive that, that has priority inheritance is the p thread mutex uh, and you have to use uh, attributes to, to uh, enable it. All the, other priority, all the other primitives in libptrad don't have priority inheritance. And even worse, we discovered a couple of weeks ago when we we're trying to do a quarterly release, the ptrad read or write lock will actually live lock in user space. Remember, we disable RT throttling, so um, the ptrad uh, read or write lock got rewritten to be more performant, so it does a lot more in user space trying to acquire the lock. But that what it ends up happening, you, you end up with this like high priority RT threads spinning in user space, trying to compete for that lock, and it live, live locks your system. Um, so that's really bad. We don't have a solution for it. I think we have a reproducing case now that we can send upstream, and we're we're going to work on see if we can do anything about it. And there's also no way to set priority inheritance on the standard mutex. There's no way to set that attribute on it. So. Uh, I talked about a partial solution a couple of years ago at ELC. Uh, we, uh, Darren Hart and, and me and the RT folks worked on uh, implementing a conditional variable that has priority inheritance support and there's also PI mutex. Um, I'm taking suggestions if you know of other libraries that work well with RT that implement POSIX locks. Um, yeah, it's not great. Uh, 
And to make matters worse, you can actually have uh, priority inversions with interrupts. Uh, so this is a real case we encountered. Uh, we had the watchdog functionality that was implemented in a CPLD. That part makes sense. It, the CPLD is doing power sequencing on that board anyway. Um, so why not do a watchdog in it? it the problem is it's on an I2C bus, which is fine for configuring. And if you just want the watchdog to reset your system, that all works great. But there's, there's a use case where we want it to fire an interrupt. And the reason you might want to do that on a real-time system is because you want to put the I.O. in a safe state. You might have like huge machinery attached to your controller, and you don't want that thing to do crazy things while your controller is rebooting. Um, so you, you fire an interrupt, and there's a the sequence that puts the I.O. in a safe state. Uh, the problem is, uh, even though the watchdog interrupt was configured to have high priority, it requires an I2C transfer to acknowledge the interrupt. And the I2C interrupt at that time was low priority in our system. And, so, and some unrelated mid priority interrupt can basically ruin your day. So you need to watch out for this and, and kind of audit your peripherals and how they're connected, what buses they use, and what interrupts priorities you set. Uh, and since I promised tricks in the presentation title, uh, this is a trick that I use a lot. Um, I talked about priority inversions. How do you go about finding locks in your application that don't have priority inversion? And a really convenient way to do this is um, to basically patch the few text is call. Uh, there's, there's a piece of code at the beginning that checks for all the priority inheritance uh, few text operations, and you can add the default case in there that just sends a segmentation fault to your process. If, if it's an RT thread, but it didn't call uh, into the Futex syscall with the PI uh, Futex uh, operation. And uh, this works a trade, uh, like if you run your application in GDB, um, you can see the exact spot where, where that call was made from, get a nice stack trace, and you can see the PTRAP primitive that caused it. In this case, it was a barrier. Um, they, they used Futex weight, and, and it was from an RT thread, so it's gonna suffer for priority inversions. Uh, so, in summary, uh, I hopefully gave you at least a starting point uh, to what real-time tools uh, to use and, and um, uh, what are useful, um, and uh, some of the tuning knobs and, and some of the safety nets you can remove, um, and uh, hopefully some of the things to avoid uh, so you won't get trapped by them. Uh, so that's all the content I have. Uh, are there any questions I can help answer? Ah, there's two from the virtual session. All right. Um, the first one is, and bear with me, I am not in this field. <laughs> I am interested in knowing if there's any, oh, sorry. I'm interested to know if there's any build system, built root, Yocto, et cetera, that integrates or makes it easy to apply most of these settings for you as in a template, instead of having to go through the checklist for any new system? Um, I am not sure. Um, I, I know uh, Red Hat has real-time offerings and, and, and the other <coughs> distro vendors. I don't remember seeing anything in Yocto related to this. Um, I mean, it's a good idea in general. Um, but yeah, I'm not aware of something that exists out of, out of the box, unless, unless uh, like I said, you use, uh, you contract with Red Hat or use one of their. Uh, That's true. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, you were saying that uh, they can check the RPM uh, spec uh, package, right? Or spec file. Spec file. Um, that, that's used in Red Hat, and, and that can be a good starting point for you. Um, and I, I should mention all our stuff is on GitHub. I mean, if you, if you want to look at our stuff, um, you can take a look there. It's GitHub slash NI. There's one more virtual question. Mm -hmm. um, does Muzi have complete support for PI Convars and Mutexes? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think it's Muscle. Um, uh, I remember there was interest from the muscle maintainer. We don't use muscles, so I'm not sure I can answer the question. Um, but I know they were cognizant of uh, 
RT applications, and, and they were trying to make it work for RT. But I, I have not used this. I'm not sure what the status is. And we have five minutes if anyone from here has a question. I'm happy to pass on the mic. Yeah, firstly, great presentation. Thank I you. had a question. Are there any multimedia pipelines that have been tried with uh, uh, like real-time uh, threads and you know drivers, I, drivers, and you know basically just from uh, hearsay on like the the RT users mailing list and and IRC channel. There's definitely people using it for audio applications and and big like stage kind of sound setups. Um, so it's. At least for sound, I believe that's true. I believe that's true for video too, because uh, uh, there's it's used on cameras and other things. So, um, like I said, we're more in the test and measurement space, so I am not sure uh, how common that is in consumer products. But um, I believe the answer is yes. Probably related to the question is, what application do you normally, the, the, the product, it's really depending on which product, it's a lot of trade-off. Yeah. It's probably why the reason um, Yakuto don't have this is uh, you, once you enable RT, you suffer from like a memory, overcommit memory, you normally right. want that stuff. So what application do you normally use this? Um, yeah, so if I understood the question correctly is, yeah, and you're correct. The reason you cannot have like just a standard set of tunings, you, it's because it's specific to your application. Um, in, for us, a lot of our applications are um, things like uh, basically hardware in the loop tests. Uh, for example, if you have a, a, like an electric vehicle inverter and you're, you're trying to simulate the car around it because you, you don't want to test it inside the car, right? You're just testing on a production line. Uh, so you're simulating everything else the car is doing, and and the only, and and you're hooking up this inverter, and the reason real time is important there because um, you have to feed the the information in real time because uh, otherwise it it can blow up in the most extreme cases, um, if you if you feed it the wrong control signals, uh, so so having a real time re uh, response to that um, is important. Another application I know from from my uh, company is. Um, if you're simulating, for example, uh, or emulating a 5G base station, for example, um, they, 5G has uh, pretty tight time slots. I believe they are like 250 microseconds or something. Uh, so if you're trying to emulate the protocol and, and send all that data, you, you have to do it on those time intervals. So it's important to have that real-time behavior. Uh, there's a lot more like that, um, production tests and, and stuff like that. All right, I think uh, we're out of go. time. Out of time, and this is the last session of the day, and I think the next one, in probably a little bit of time, is in like one minute. If you all go right. back to the showcase where all the sponsors are, there is a booth crawl if anyone wants to participate. All right, awesome. see you tomorrow. Well, thank you so much.